brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. The new liturgical year is just a couple of weeks away. Advent begins on the 28th of November, and with it a traditional season of both anticipation and joyful celebration, as well as a season of penance, personal sacrifice, and preparation for the coming of the birth of our Lord begins. In our day and age, Advent has been subsumed into the larger preparations for Christmas. And this is a shame, really, because Advent has many traditional observances that enrich the season. And today I'm going to go over a few of those with you, but with a focus on the penitential nature of Advent, because what our time calls for now more than ever is penance, personal sacrifice and expiation for our sins, and the sins of the hierarchy. But don't worry, it's not all fasts and that sort of thing, and I'm saving most of that for the end. So let's talk about Advent. First, what is Advent? Dom Prosper Geringer, the great theologian of the 19th century, tells us this about Advent. From his masterpiece work, The Liturgical Year, he says, quote, The name Advent, from the Latin word Adventus, which signifies a coming, is applied in the Latin Church to that period of the year during which the Church requires the faithful to prepare for the celebration of the Feast of Christmas, the anniversary of the birth of Jesus Christ. The mystery of that great day had every right to the honor of being prepared for by prayer and works of penance. We must look upon Advent in two different lights. First as a time of preparation, properly so called, for the birth of our Savior, by works of penance, and secondly, as a series of ecclesiastical offices drawn up for the same purpose. We find as far back as the 5th century the custom of giving exhortations to the people in order to prepare them for the Feast of Christmas. The oldest document in which we find the length and exercises of Advent mentioned with anything like clearness is a passage in the second book of the History of the Franks by St. Gregory of Tours, where he says that St. Perpetuus, one of his predecessors, who held that see about the year 480, had decreed a fast three times a week from the feast of St. Martin until Christmas. It would be impossible to decide whether St. Perpetuus, by his regulations, established a new custom or merely enforced an ex already existing law. Let us, however, note this inter interval of 40, or rather 43 days, so expressly mentioned and consecrated to penance, as though it were a second Lent, though less strict and severe than that which precedes Easter. End quote. A second, less severe Lent. That doesn't quite jive with how things are done in the contemporary church or in the world today, right? We're all used to the return of the O antiphons during Advent, with hymns like O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, a personal favorite of mine, among others. But outside of that, we get precious little guidance from the church in our time on how to make a truly holy Advent. I'll talk about Advent fasting and abstinent guidelines here in a moment, but first let's, have, let's talk about a little lighter stuff. Let's talk about some basic traditional Advent observances. Now, in addition to cultural ones, because there's a myriad of cultural ones, mostly from Europe and South America and elsewhere, that you should look into if, you, if your lineage comes from those places. Reclaim those. Those are part of your Catholic heritage. Don't be ashamed of them. But in addition to all that, we're going to talk about a basic one. You've probably all heard about the Advent wreath, I would hope. At least I'd hope you'd have if you're a Catholic or even a high church Protestant watching or listening to this. From an article from the Catholic Company website, they describe Advent wreaths like this. Quote, One of the most popular ways to celebrate Advent is with an Advent wreath or Advent candle holders. Four candles, three purple and one pink, are used to count down the weeks until Christmas. Each Sunday of Advent, one of the candles is lit and special prayers are said. Each Sunday of Advent has a particular theme leading up to the birth of Christ. End quote. Each candle represents a particular Sunday on the liturgical calendar. I could probably make an entire video on the meaning of Advent wreaths and its candles. Maybe I should. Let me know in the comments if you would like me to do that. It could be an interesting exercise. I think it would be better to cover a few lesser-known Advent practices, though. For example, have you ever heard of a Jesse tree? Many people put up their Christmas trees early, and don't worry, I'm not going to be one of those internet trads telling you not to do that. But the Jesse tree is an interesting practice that can supplement your Advent celebrations. The Jesse tree was named after Jesse from the Old Testament, and the tree is a reference to the passage from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Quote, And there shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse, and a flower shall rise up out of his root. End quote. Most contemporary translations use the word branch or tree, but I use the Dewey Rams for most things, and so you get the idea. Jesse is in the lineage of David and is one of the ancestors of Jesus. 
the idea here is this. Using a picture of a tree each day leading up to Christmas, an ornament is placed on the tree. That is an explicit reference to a story in the Bible. You could even use this as a means of decorating your Christmas tree if you wanted to, though you'd have to find some Jesse tree ornaments, which I am absolutely certain exist, and that somebody out there is selling them probably on Etsy or somewhere else. But using these stories, you trace the story of Jesus and his ancestors from the first day of creation to the birth of Jesus all through Advent. It's a pretty nice exercise that really helps to bring the story of the Old Testament through Bethlehem to life in your home. The practice itself is pretty old and does not involve trees. Originally, in the Middle Ages, the practice came from stained glass windows. In those times, most people didn't re really read all that much, though they were probably not as illiterate as our contemporary so-called scholars would have you believe. But stained glass was used to tell biblical stories, and in this time, the stained glass windows of some ancient and now gone churches would tell that story. But most significantly, a Jesse tree can give you a more constructive time with scripture, help you to bring scripture to life for your families, and especially your young ones, and it can help you really dive into the royal lineage of Christ the King. There is an indulgence attached to reading scripture for 15 minutes each day, by the way, so the practice of the Jesse tree can definitely aid you in attaining the graces of indulgences. And remember, it is November, and the Vatican expanded the All Saints and All Souls indulgences for prayers for the dead through the entire month. So make sure to engage in that practice all through the end of the month. Don't let this, these kind of opportunities go to waste. Another important means of having a holy Advent season is the observation of the feast days. There are several major feasts in Advent, but I'll highlight two of them. St. Nicholas Day and the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the latter of which is a holy day of obligation and lands on the 8th of December, a Wednesday in this year, 2021. The Feast of St. Nicholas is something that my family is making part of our Advent traditions. Instead of embracing the secular notions of Santa Claus, we're going to go with St. Nicholas. And we'll be observing it by giving our kids their stockings and telling them the real story of St. Nicholas. His actions in life led to the practice of Christmas stockings as we know them today. But his story is one based on charity and almsgiving, both of which are practices we should engage in year-round, but are especially poignant at this time of year, and especially this year, I think. And that brings me to almsgiving. As Chris Sparks, writing over at DivineMercy.org, said back in 2018, amidst the Ted McCarrick mess, Advent is a season of justice and mercy. Quote, It's a penitential season, though that's often forgotten, and it's focused on preparing our souls to joyfully celebrate Christmas, the great solemnity of the Nativity of Christ. We mark his incarnation, which took place 2,000 years ago. We mark his coming to us in word and sacrament, in everyday life, and through all the works of his hands, and we look forward with joyful expectation to Christ's coming again at the end of the world. So Advent teaches us to do justice in order to be prepared to receive mercy. We are to repent for our sins, do penance, and live the moral law he's given to us in scripture and tradition, the law of love modeled for us by the saints, in order to be wide open to the mercy of God. We are also to seek for justice in the church and the world, following and spreading the church's social teaching so that we may help usher in a better society, leading to a civilization of merciful love, end quote. Almsgiving is an act of both justice and mercy, according to the church, and there are frankly no shortage of ways of doing that at this time of year. But I highly, highly, highly recommend you find a good Catholic organization, emphasis on the word good, to do the almsgiving with, and avoid those groups with the bells in front of the local grocery stores, since they're tied to schismatic groups who teach a different gospel than that of our Lord, and who rather overtly reject things he himself said in sacred scripture. Maybe you could sponsor a seminarian. You find a seminarian who needs a gift. I bet you that they would love something. Or, and here's a novel thought, you can give alms directly to those in need. I'm reminded of something the Newman Center I was part of in college did back in Portland in the late part of Advent. Every year, the students and religious who run the place would pile into cars with wrapped presents and give them to the homeless in Portland, as well as hot chocolate and food and the rest. That is perfectly in keeping with the spirit of Advent, and it is direct action that doesn't cost much money. I mean, the kinds of gifts we're talking about was warm clothes so they could make it through winter. Doesn't, not the most expensive thing. But let's move on to fasting. Advent is a time of penance. And fasting is a classic act of penance. We are Catholics, which means we are a fasting people as well as a praying people. Here are the guidelines that the church had before the contemporary mess of things in the church. The website Liturgical Arts Journal has the practices that were in force in the U.S. from the 1880s outlined on their site. And it's pretty useful and rigorous enough that in our times of rampant apostasy and heresy in the church, that they should be at least sufficient at means of making reparation in our lives in this season. Or at least they're a good starting point. 
According to that article, the rules came from a Baltimore manual done by the same uh, ecclesial synod in the United States that gave us the Baltimore Catechism. Quote, The Fridays in Advent should be kept as days of abstinence and fast. There was only one full meal allowed, and no meat could be eaten at all, at all during the whole day. We're talking Fridays here during Advent. Most of us have generally heard the fasting discipline described as one full meal and two quote-unquote collations that together do not make up a full meal. The Baltimore Manual, however, reflects an earlier formulation and is a bit more specific. The law of fasting includes that of abstinence and adds special requirements of its own. It affects both the kind and the quantity of food. On fasting days, besides the obligation of abstaining from flesh meat, the number and quantity of meals are restricted. Only one full meal is allowed, to be taken at noon or later. Besides this full meal, a collation of eight ounces is allowed. The full meal is taken about the middle of the day. The collation will naturally be taken in the evening. If the full meal is taken late in the day, the collation may be taken about noon. Besides the full meal and collation, general custom has made it lawful to take about two ounces of bread without butter and a cup of some warm liquid, a coffee or tea, for example, in the morning. This is important to observe, for by means of this many persons are enabled, and therefore obliged, to keep the fast who could not otherwise do so. End quote. Yeah, that's much more rigorous than what we're used to in our time, but I hope many of you will be brave enough to at least try it. Remember, we live in extraordinary times, and in times such as ours, we are called to go beyond what the church requires of us, which in this time is frankly not all that much. That article also makes mention of the UK at that time having a similar fast on both Wednesday and Friday in Advent. Now, those of you enrolled in the Brown Scapular will find those fasting requirements familiar, even if you, like me, instead of engaging in the Wednesday and Friday and Saturday fast associated with the Scapular, pray the Little Office of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is also a, a, an acceptable practice for the Brown Scapular. But anyway, to sum up, here's the fasting for Advent. From that article again, quote, on Fridays in Lent, one full meal is allowed to be taken at noon or later. An additional collation of eight ounces is also allowed in the evening if the full meal is at noon or at noon if the main meal is in the evening. General custom allows two ounces of bread without butter in the morning with a cup of warm liquid, coffee or tea. Without being too rigorous about the whole thing, some might well appreciate seeing these fasting rules spelled out so precisely rather than just set out as general guidelines. That we, let's face it, can talk ourselves into mitigating, end quote. Boy, howdy, are we as sinners good at mitigating these kinds of requirements. Me, among the first of them who are so good at mitigating these things, trust me on this, I am not trying to make myself sound holier than thou. This does not sound pleasant to me, but it is, our, it is that time, we live in times where this is so desperately needed in the church. Now, of course, the church doesn't require this at all in our time. We're barely called to fast anymore, and one has to wonder if that isn't at least a slight part of the problem in the church today. The fasting and abstinence are certainly not easy, but they can be done. And one last note here. Flesh meat does not include fish. Fish is permitted on Fridays in Advent, like they are in Lent. Anyway, I do hope you found this helpful. Normally on a weekend I don't include a sources blog post, but today I will do so if you want to see these sources to go deeper. You should just go head over to returntotradition.org and look for the post with the title of this podcast and you'll see what I mean. Let's make this Advent count and offer our sufferings for the church in her time of need as we prepare to commemorate the birth of our blessed Lord. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.